Welcome back to the Green Swindle. Now, for decades, world leaders have pushed the U.S. to sign an international climate agreement. But we discovered that these agreements are about much more than just the environment. We all have to agree that the potential for serious climate disruption is real. Our first step should be to set realistic and achievable binding emissions limits. Now, that was 1997, and global warming hysteria reached a fever pitch. Now, the UN and the IPCC pushed hard for an international agreement that would require nations to reduce their carbon emissions, and the Clinton administration jumped on board. Now is the time to cut back emissions, design 21st century solutions, and begin the steps necessary to return our planet to the stable climate balance that has been enjoyed by our ancestors. Now this set the tone for two infamous treaties that in the end were never signed, but they did expose the true agenda of global warming hysterics to punish the United States, redistribute wealth, and force developed nations to de-industrialize. Notice that no agreement requires anything. No agreement tabled so far. There are several proposals. None of them require anything by the countries where emissions are not only going up, but skyrocketing. It's not about emissions. It's about us. The push for an international climate treaty started with the Kyoto Protocol back in 1997, and when that failed, the second attempt came at last year's Copenhagen Conference. In the latter part of the Clinton administration, the president made a strong push for a climate agreement. As we get ready for the Kyoto Conference, I believe there should be realistic but binding limits to emissions of greenhouse gases. But the Clinton-Gore team faced a major problem. The U.S. Senate staunchly opposed any treaty that would harm the U.S. The Senate gave unanimous, not, not bipartisan, nonpartisan uh, support for a resolution instructing the Clinton Gore administration don't go to Kyoto in December and agree to this treaty or anything that looks like it unless it covers, treats other countries like it does us and or. Uh, you guarantee it will not significantly harm the United States economy. Even Democrats known for their environmentalism opposed the treaty, including Massachusetts Senator John Kerry, Delaware Senator Joe Biden, California Senator Barbara Boxer, and Massachusetts Senator Ted Kennedy. But that did not sit well with the vice president or intervene to make sure the U.S. would sign the accord, regardless of what the Senate had to say. After talking with our negotiators this morning, and after speaking on the telephone from here a short time ago with President Clinton, I am instructing our delegation right now to show increased negotiating flexibility. With blatant disregard for the Senate, Gore agreed to a disastrous international treaty obligating the United States to reduce its emissions 5% below 1990 levels. Now, he also made it clear that he would go along with the environmental agenda at any cost. It was absolutely a spectacular capitulation and utterly, utterly unthinking agreement to terms that were drafted by Europe solely to benefit Europe and solely to disadvantage us. Our critics charged that the treaty would have crippled the U.S. economy. Projections are that electric rates would have gone up by at least 50 percent, gasoline at the pump by a dollar a gallon, and natural gas prices between 30 and 50 percent. They also say it unfairly targeted the U.S. and other industrialized nations. The idea was for the industrialized nations of the world, the wealthy nations, to agree to binding limits on their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but developing nations, including countries like China and India, were left out. It exempts 155 countries. It gives them a free ride. Of course they're on board. Now, almost a year later, in November of 1998, President Clinton signed the Kyoto Protocol. The agreement is environmentally strong and economically sound. It reflects a commitment by our generation to act in the interest of future generations. The Senate, however, saw things differently and made it clear it would never ratify this treaty. In my opinion, the Kyoto deal is dead on arrival. It is designed to give some nations a free ride. It is designed to raise energy prices in the U.S. Now, Gore's maneuver in the Kyoto Protocol showed Americans' willingness to appease environmental extremists. Now, his spirit was revived at last year's Copenhagen conference, this time with President Obama leading the charge. We come here in Copenhagen because climate change poses a grave and growing danger. 
but the summit was thrown off course when a draft copy of the proposed agreement leaked out. Now, it showed plans to force industrialized countries to pay developing nations an amount equivalent to 0.5% of their GDP. In short, it would have levied a tax on countries like the U.S. to give money to poor nations. Like Kyoto, this was a blatant attempt to redistribute wealth in the name of the environment. The third world has decided to use this treaty uh, to bring about a massive shift of wealth from the United States to developing countries. In effect, what the third world, including China, is saying is we Chinese will lend you a hundred billion dollars and you pay interest and then you give it back to us in the other third world countries to spend on cleaning up our environment and building more factories to compete with your American made products. Uh, that's probably the worst deal that I've heard in all my 30 years in Congress. While a global environmental treaty eludes us, Al Gore and President Obama have put the U.S in a dangerous spot by showing that we will sacrifice our sovereignty for those who do not have our best interests at heart. Still ahead, the world's top climate scientists caught green-handed pushing an alarmist agenda. Their emails and the climate gate scandal, straight ahead. Welcome back to the Green Swindle. Now, skeptics have long doubted the science behind global warming, and a recent scandal shows that they had good reason to be suspicious. In November 2009, an unknown hacker released thousands of emails from the University of East Anglia's Climatic Research Unit, sparking a controversy that will forever be known as ClimateGate. Now the emails reveal a plot among the world's top climate scientists to hide the real inconvenient truth that the evidence supporting man-made global warming is far from conclusive. The Climatic Research Unit, or CRU, provides temperature data to both governments and organizations like the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, the unit run by renowned scientist Phil Jones collaborates with scientists worldwide, most notably Michael Mann, head of Penn State's Earth System Science Center. Michael Mann and Phil Jones are probably the two main figures in a very small clique of climate scientists. They're a group of scientists who work together to make sure that their view of paleoclimatology is seen as the correct or dominant view in the scientific literature. Now their view of climate science is best represented by Michael Mann's now famous hockey stick graph. The graph reconstructs temperatures over the past 1,000 years. Now it shows the earth warming at an alarming rate in the 20th century. It became an icon. It was central to virtually every uh, government's arguments that something had to be done about global warming now. However, the science behind the graph is questionable. Starting with man's data, in particular, his use of bristle cone pine trees to reconstruct temperatures. Now several scientists argue that due to their natural deformities, these trees do not make good specimens for data collection. Pretty much everyone who's ever looked at them, including the National Academy of Science panel, said they shouldn't be used for temperature proxies. Now, similar criticism has been leveled at his methodology. Subsequent studies show a key step in his technique could generate a hockey stick even if random numbers are used. Now, this was the case in the first seven panels of this chart. He used a mathematical technique that loaded all the weight of the final graph on these bristlecone pines, and that's what really distorted the picture. In fact, when the hockey stick is compared to another tree ring graph by the climatologist Keith Briffa, the results diverge sharply starting around 1960. The ClimateGate emails show Mann and Jones struggling with what they should present to the public in the IPCC report to account for the discrepancy. What are they going to do about the fact that Keith's graph is going in the wrong direction and it detracts from this nice tidy story that they want to tell? So in that case, they just chopped off the post-1960 portion of Briffa's graph. Bill Jones faced the same problem when preparing another report for the World Meteorological Organization. Once again, he removed part of Briffa's data. In an email uncovered in ClimateGate, he writes about using Mike's nature trick to hide the decline. Above all, the hockey stick craft proved very lucrative for Michael Mann. Now, last year alone, he received more than $2.4 million in stimulus money, and that's not all. At least $19, $20 million has come into CRU in recent years. The money's come from the European Union. It's come from NATO. It's come from the United Nations. It's come from the United States of America. Along with money came additional scrutiny led by economists Ross McKittrick and mathematician 
Stephen McIntyre. We saw the hockey stick graph all over the place, and it, people just kept referring to it as sort of the uh, the last word on the subject. So it was intriguing the role it was playing, uh, including in policy discussions. Their request for information triggered numerous emails between Mann, Jones, and the rest of the team behind the hockey stick graph. Mann writes of his research, quote, this is the sort of dirty laundry one doesn't want to fall into the hands of those who might potentially try to distort things. You have emails like that talking about dirty laundry and distortion and deletion and tricks. It really does mock the integrity of the scientific method and those of us who are really serious about science. The emails that show the manipulation of data were very incriminating, but the written discussions about destroying records proved to be the most damning. Once they had been asked for email correspondence concerning the production of the IPCC report, and there's an email from Jones to Michael Mann asking him to delete any emails he had related to the IPCC report and that he was going to ask other of their colleagues to do the same. It doesn't stop there. The hockey graph team was determined to prevent opposing viewpoints from gaining traction. The prime example. In 2005, they attempted to discredit the editor of the scientific journal Geophysical Research Letters after he published one of McIntyre and McKittrick's papers questioning the hockey graph. There's evidence that they were uh, trying to get the editor of the journal fired. The fact that they did actually uh, engage in a conspiracy to try to get him forced out is again indicative of an attitude towards the scientific process uh, which is deeply disturbing. Even the IPCC doesn't emerge unscathed. Now critics claim it let their allegiance to the hockey stick clout its judgment. The hockey stick issue was known to IPCC as a problem five years ago. Instead of having an independent uh, author in the assessment, they had a close associate of the people involved. That close associate was none other than hockey team member Keith Briffa. So what did skeptics think of his report? Partisan hardly covers it. I mean, it was, first of all, incompetent. I don't even think that Briffa had read the papers that he was summarizing. When ClimateGate broke, the emails went viral and five investigations were launched. While the scientists were cleared of any wrongdoing, critics called these investigations a sham. All of these inquiries have been a disappointment. In a sense, the documentation is there and uh, the, the record is there. We're still waiting for a real inquiry to be formed that will get to the bottom of what we're doing. While the culprits claim innocence, they're still trying to rewrite history. In a recent interview with the BBC, Mann said this about the hockey stick graph. I always thought it was somewhat misplaced to make it a central icon of the climate change debate. While the quote investigations turned up nothing, the impact of ClimateGate is clear. The reputation of the CRU has been trashed. The United Nations has become more of a laughing stock than ever because they seem to buy everything coming out of the CRU. Coming up is market socialism headed for America, the emissions trading scheme that's on its way to becoming law. That and more.